Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not just one or two. Oh. 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 Pardon? Okay, Yeah. we don't need that. That Jake, I'll be right, that Jake. <laughs> That's what I thought there for a minute, too. Who's <laughs> really efficient? It's <laughs> not going to come out. Look like. <laughs> All right, good afternoon. We call to order the study session of the West Valley City Council. It is January 24th, 2023. And it is at 4.30. We're in the multi-purpose room of West Valley City Hall. We have all members of the council present. We have Councilman Fitzy Amanu, and he is um, virtual. And then we have Councilman Norfelt, Councilman Christensen, Councilman Whetstone, Councilman Harmon, Councilman Hoon, and myself. We're joined at the table also by our city manager, Mr. Pyle, and our city recorder, Ms. Kamek. We will now turn to the approval of the minutes for January 17th, 2023. I'll turn it to the council for comments or a motion. I move for approval of those minutes. Second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And those are aye. Thank you. Um, we have our regular meeting this afternoon. Was there any changes? Uh, just one item to update on, ma'am. The okay. council asked for some information on the um, the, the Ridge Golf Course um, item that's on the regular meeting tonight. So we looked into that, and Eric has some some additional information on that. We'll have him come up. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor and Council. Eric Bunderson. Um, Director of Justice and Technology. So I did some uh, research, or my guys did, uh, into Starlink. And indeed, uh, you can get a, a Starlink kind of commercial unit kit for $2,500. Uh, and then it's $500 a month um, ongoing for the service. Um, we get that done in about two to four weeks. Uh, the, the speeds are slightly higher than what we've got right now. Um, we're doing about from that antenna, remember I told you about the antenna from the police building down to the to the golf course itself. We're getting about 50 megabits uh, per second. And um, the satellite can actually get about 350 using what they call best efforts. And a little research into customer reports. And what that best efforts means is that's the max it could do. And uh, the average is probably 
100 to 200. So it's a little faster than what we've got right now. Um, the upload speed is about 50 uh, megabits per second. So it's, it's about the same as what we've got. Um, so the, the other things that some customer reviews and, um, and uh, other online reviews, I guess, showed is that there's a little bit of latency with the satellite. And that is the time that it takes for the signal to go up, hit the satellite, go down and hit a Google server, come back up. It's not bad. It's actually, it's actually quite workable unless we're trading stocks um, or maybe playing Fortnite. And I don't think we're doing that at the golf course. So we're not too worried about that. Um, they do have a tiered pricing structure. So if we go over a certain data amount, we get charged more, they throttle it down. Uh, Utopia doesn't do that. Support seems um, to be okay from what we, what we read. Uh, we've, we can either apply directly to Starlink to get the, the service, or we could go through some resellers that we have around here. Um, it seems like a really good uh, service for um, if, you, if you don't have internet, which we don't there. Um, they're, they're using it for a lot of maritime applications, cabins, um, things like that, where, where there's just not good internet. Um, so, I, I think our recommendation, frankly, would be if the council doesn't want to go with the utopia, we might want to just invest in the existing equipment we have, see if we can speed that up a little, because we're getting a faster internet service, but we're also going to have potentially the same problems with environmental um, concerns, wind, throwing the satellite dish around and stuff like that. Um, we, we definitely could do it, but I think it wouldn't be that great of an improvement um, uh, over the current situation. Now, the other thing that we did is we went back to Utopia and kind of sharpened our pencils a little, and we said um, the $700 a month could actually be reduced to $50 a month. So the install would still be 43,000. But what we could do is during the course of that install, they'd basically just give us the, the pipe and we'd run the internet out of here, out of city hall. Um, our speed would still be pretty darn good. It'd probably still be close to a gig up and a gig down um, from here. And that would only cost an extra $50 a month as opposed to $700 a month. The reason that we originally on the Utopia proposed the $700 a month is to have, in case City Hall went down and the fire station, the police station went down, to have that redundancy. But as the golf course is not a, um, uh, you know, like a mission critical, lives aren't in danger, uh, I think if, if, we just connected to that city hall, we'd still be pretty reliable. We don't, we don't go down a lot at city hall anyway. So that's, that's the, the, the report. I'm happy to answer any other questions or, um, you know, any, anything else the council wants to talk about? Any questions? Because I walked in very oh, rudely halfway through your presentation. Yeah. Can you summarize the total cost of the then that's when it's Oh, sure. Yeah. It's 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 pretty big, frankly. The Starlink is twenty five hundred dollars uh, for the equipment, and then five hundred dollars a month. Um, the Utopia is forty three thousand dollars for the fiber optic line, and then fifty or seven hundred dollars a month, depending on uh, depending on what the council's preference would be. Um, yeah. Here, would you yes. go over a little bit more detail what the 42,000 is for? It's not just for equipment. It's not just for plugging in the line. We actually, and you did mention this last week, but just by way of reiteration, oh. we got to run this pipe yeah. from the police storage room. Yeah. yeah. Storage building. That's why the, the cost. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're the actual capital expenditure to construct this line. That's right. There. They're, they're trenching and installing an actual fiber optic line. Um, from from wherever. I'm not sure if it's from the police building or from the street on the other side, but it's from somewhere where there's another Utopia connection that's branching off of that. And we have found Utopia to be very reliable, very fast. We have it here at the um, here at the city and it's a it's a pretty good system. 
but you know that's the that's the report on all those things. I hope I've been fair in all of in all of the pros and cons of everything. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Anything else on the regular meeting think, today? I don't think so, ma'am. I think it was it. Hey, did anybody else have questions on today's meeting? Okay. Well, now to go to our proclamations for next week. Nicole, do you want to explain this one? Yep. So this is from Hunter High School. It's the Future Business Leaders of America. And we actually will have students from the school attend the meeting and someone will read it. So one of them will one read of it. The students will, yeah. Oh, awesome. I like participation. Thank you. Okay. Sweet. All right. We'll now move on to our resolutions. And we have resolution 23-09. Mr. Pyle, thanks. Do you want to take that or? Yeah, I will. I know Nicole's name is on it, but I don't think she's here. Um, as you all, are down there, right? As you all saw in my uh, text or email, whichever was I sent last week, we did determine we needed to send, to get formal authorization on that. We have cut the track check, we're ready to go. So if the council's desire would be for us to release that to the league before we have the uh, regular meeting, this would come up on the seventh. We can do that as well, but but we do need to do that. So that's the only additional information. Okay. Any questions on that one? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to resolution 2310 and we'll turn the time over to Mr. Madsen. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight I'm here to present three vehicles. Uh, we have a 10 wheeler and two bobtails. Um, they're going to be used in the stormwater division on the 10 wheeler. It's going to be upfitted with a lot of expensive stuff. Our costs have gone through the roof. They're about 25% higher than we paid two years ago. The, the equipment we're putting on the vehicle has actually exceeded the cost of the truck. So that's a first for me. It's always been the opposite. That 10 wheeler, we're going to install our first ever wing plow. It'll have an eight foot plow that comes out the side of the truck, kind of like the UDOT trucks, kind of mid shift out the side. It'll still have the 12 foot up front, but it'll just be able to push the side as it's going down, like for 41, the bigger streets. So will this, so on the smaller streets, like 31, will just one truck be able to do it instead of one follow the other yep. offset? Yep. Okay. And I mean, I don't know what them numbers are, what it cuts down, but it, it should help. And I think as we go forward, we'll get a couple more of them. And then we could probably do the major ways with just two trucks instead of three and four. And then let the others go off and do side streets. Yep. So it should help with efficiency and getting us out on the road quicker and getting stuff done. The other two are the uh, smaller dump trucks, and they're going to be used by operations. They will have snow plows and salters on them. We're not going to put the wings on the, the smaller truck. We're going to save them for the 10 wheel dump trucks. And that's it. Okay. Any questions? Any council questions? Good explanation. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. All right. We'll now turn the time over to Mr. Johnson for some engineering services. Thank you. This resolution will authorize the city to enter into a contract with Horrocks engineers um, for some pavement management planning. So uh, every three years, the city is required by the governmental accounting rules um, that, that are that we live by to, uh, to make an assessment of the condition of our pavements and other concrete infrastructure, things like that, and, and then use that assessment to, to uh, plan the maintenance activities on the asset. So in the past, we've used um, we've used, they're called LTAP. It's a, it's a local technical assistance program. It's basically students that would drive this, the city, look at the roads and then kind of give it a, a bit of a subjective rating. Um, and then three years ago, we hired a company called Roadbotics that, uh, drove the city taking with, with an automatic gizmo that, that took photos of the roads and, and then using an AI al algorithm, assess the condition rating to the uh, to the roads. And this time we're proposing a, a similar process. Um, it's a it's a process where Horrocks would drive the city 
And um, instead of taking photos, they will take photos as well, but they're also gonna use, um, uh, collect LIDAR data, which is a, uh, well, it stands for light detecting and ranging, basically 3D data. So we're gonna end up with a point cloud um, of every single road in the city that will be used A for the, uh, for the pavement condition analysis. It'll, you know, it looks at the cracks in the pavement and, and determines um, it'll give it a score and something that we can use to evaluate the condition of the pavement and make pavement management plans. But then it'll also, um, we have the point cloud, like the actual data, which is like a 3D model of every single road in the city. So when engineering is doing work, instead of sending somebody out with a GPS to take one point at a time to, to identify where foot and gutter is located and different things to enable them to, to start design work, they have the design ready to go. They have the, the survey ready to go. They go out and do a, a like a two hour calibration and take a couple of points and get these points to match up to the surveyed points. And, and so, um, uh, yeah, so we, we end up with kind of a dual purpose um, use for, for this with this contract. So we, um, it is more expensive. We could get the, uh, um, we could get the, uh, a photo type analysis done for about a hundred thousand dollars less, but I've spoken with Kobe in engineering and, and they've had their, uh, team, they, they downloaded a, some sample data and, um, have, have tried, uh, working with it and, and it, they feel like it's beneficial. Um, survey services that we pay for are quite expensive. And so we're kind of automating that process by getting the whole city with with a, dr a driving truck. So anyways, that is my report and I'll answer any questions if you have any. <clears throat> any questions? Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll now turn the time over to Mr. Evans. Mm -hmm. It says the rest of the crew's here, but. We have Chief here. He'll give the presentation about new monitors. Thank you. Uh, there's some technical questions I brought. Back up. <laughs> but, but the guy who knows everything about these, these are uh, cardiac monitors that we use. They're the Zoll Life Packs. Uh, these cardiac monitors are a 12 lead AKG. Uh, as you've seen in the, the issue paper, we can, uh, do defibrillation, uh, blood pressures, uh, pulse oximeters, we can cardiac pace pa patients. We are required with our license being an advanced life support <clears throat> to have cardiac monitors that will do all these functions on our rigs. What this contract is, is uh, a continuation of uh, five monitors that we bought five years ago. Uh, we're, we'll keep the payment going. So basically what it is in five years, the payment has went up $10,000, which quite honestly isn't bad in today's market after five years. The other thing this will do is right now, one of our heavy apparatus, heavy apparatus meaning one of the engines or the ladder trucks does not have one of these units on it. So with this contract, we will be able to, uh, every one of our units will have a 12 lead EKG, a Zoll monitor on it. Uh, the other thing with, with these monitors, um, these will come with a five-year warranty. We don't have to do anything. Some of our older monitors that we're going to have to replace, we, over the last couple of years, have had to pay quite a bit of money to keep them serviceable. So uh, they're pretty much at the end of their lifespan. And so we're just asking, uh, we'll continue the payment with a $10,000 a year increase and it will come out of the ambulance fund. Okay. Any questions for Chief Evans? If there's technical, they can answer them. But they don't let me touch them or I would have brought one, but they don't let me touch them. <laughs> you might break it? Well, I might shock somebody or something. <laughs> okay, so I can't touch it. Thank you. All right, we'll turn the time over to Mr. Bundersons for some annual training. Hello again, Council, Eric Bunderson, um, city attorney this time. So the, uh, the annual training uh, is actually a requirement by state statute. And um, obviously I'm 
a very boring person. And so one of the things I love is a good checklist. And um, I found this checklist on the state auditor site for the open meetings. And I think it's really good. So I've included that in your packet. And um, I think you can go through it on your own and, and look at things. I don't have to, I'm not gonna read every one of them. But as you can see, the very first thing is the very first checklist is the governing body members are provided with annual training on open public meetings. That's what we're doing here today. And we're also going to cover um, ethics and we're also going to cover sexual harassment a, a little bit. So as you go through this checklist, like I said, it's I think it's very good. And it talks about all the things that we need to do to make sure we're operating uh, legally here. And um, first thing is notice. And thank goodness for Miss K. Mack because she is and, and has always been very, very good at notice. Um, one of the things that you'll see is we probably over notice you a little. Um, if, if, we, if we imagine seven of you could be at the same place at an activity or an event, we're gonna go ahead and post that as an open meeting. Other cities might not do that, but that's just out of an abundance of caution that we do that and it's, it's served us well. We've never gotten in trouble uh, for one of these things. Uh, so she handles that. And then um, I guess the, the sort of where that comes from is that we just want to start with the assumption that, that when there's a quorum of you, that it's an open meeting. And then kind of if there are exceptions to that, then we work back through those exceptions. But it, we just like to say every time there's four of you together, we're going to call that a quorum, we're going to call that a meeting, and we're going to announce it. Now... The next thing is closed meetings, and we've we've talked about this before, but um, this includes all of the reasons in the checklist here that you can uh, close a meeting. Now, you're familiar with most of these. That's a professional competence. Um, we don't do collective bargaining a lot, uh, but that's a reason you can close a meeting. Uh, imminent litigation, we've done that before. Uh, real real property with these. Uh, certain conditions, um, that's the sale or the purchase thereof, deployment of security personnel, um, investigations of criminal misconduct, and then there's some other things that are very rare. Uh, we used to meet, as, or you used to meet as a body to discuss uh, grandma appeals. Do you remember that? For any of you there for that? Some of you. Um, and so when you're meeting as a deliberative body, uh, you can go into a closed session. The other possible reason you would do that is if there's a procurement appeal. That is, if somebody, uh, you know, didn't get a road project and was appealing that, you might be one of the steps in that appeal process. And then um, some, some of the other stuff is really not uh, going to ever apply to you. So uh, we've talked about this before, but you can't hold a closed meeting to interview a person uh, applying to fill an elected position. Uh, or anything kind of of that nature. And uh, we record all of these meetings except for the professional competence and the security. And when we don't record them, the mayor must sign a sworn statement affirming that the purpose of, of that meeting was for one of those purposes. So the only thing that this checklist doesn't include, because it's a rather new piece of legislation, is the anchor location. And um, if you recall, we can have electronic meetings, which we do. We announce those every week. And in order to have an electronic meeting, you have to have an anchor location, which is a place where um, people can come and watch the, watch the meeting. You know, and our anchor location is almost always City Hall here. Um, but during the pandemic, the legislature allowed for an electronic meeting without an anchor location. But uh, the mayor has to determine that there's a substantial risk to health or safety. And we did that. Uh, some of you were here during those pandemic times, and we did that. And uh, the mayor would have to renew that every 30 days. And, um, uh, and I think that worked pretty well. And I hope, I hope we never have to do that again, frankly. Um, but, but we have the ability to do that if we need to. Okay. Um, second topic, municipal ethics. Now, there's also a checklist at the state auditor's website uh, on municipal ethics. 
I felt like it was missing a significant portion. So I, I did not provide it to you. I felt like it was missing um, essentially all the elements of, of bribery. And, um, and I don't want to risk, uh, I don't want to risk giving you that document and not including all of the, all of the uh, potential things uh, that could go wrong. And so I, I didn't include that. So the big takeaways for our municipal ethics are you can't use the office for personal benefit and you must disclose conflicts that you have with the city. So it's two big buckets. For that first bucket, you can't use the office for personal benefit. So the example that I always use, and I'm sorry I use this year after year, but if you were able to get some information from one of our closed sessions or some kind of other protected confidential information under grandma, and you were then to turn around and use that information for profit, that is, you discovered the whereabouts of a murder victim who's, you know, who, that wasn't public, and then you wrote a blog post or you wrote a book or anything like that, and you made money from that, then um, that would be a violation. You'd be using your, your personal, you'd be using your office for personal benefit. And the same goes for all the other stuff you could imagine, like um, getting a loan or, or, you know, like getting out of a ticket and things like that. That's, that's all that stuff is prohibited. Um, the, the interesting thing that I always find about this is this, pro, this actually applies to everybody, um, who's an employee in this room. Um, so it's not just the city council. It's any, it's any, uh, appointed, uh, municipal employees. Gifts are also included in this. Um, the council and again, municipal employees are allowed to accept occasional non-cash gifts of less than $50. That number has not changed in uh, 15 years. So uh, kind of uh, with inflation that might not even buy a, a nice dinner anymore, but that's still what the number is. It's occasional non-cash gift um, worth less than $50. Now. There are exceptions to that. And if you ever find yourself in a position where you need to ask or, or, or you're unsure, please just ask me. There's, there's kind of an, a little checklist that we can go through to, to talk about that. But the, the safest bet is uh, $50 or less, non-cash. Now, the other bucket that I wanted to talk about was this disclosure idea. And I always find this interesting again, because I'm probably a boring person, but I find it interesting that it sort of contemplates the rural nature of most of Utah in that a county commissioner or a city councilman in a, a small town may also have a construction company, may also be running, you know, any other kind of things. And so um, that's okay. You can have business dealings with the city as long as you disclose them. And, and so disclosure is the key. Um, if you're being paid to assist somebody with a business transaction with the city, totally okay. Just disclose it. Um, you do have to do that 10 days before the transaction is, uh, is done. Um, you can also run a business within the city that is regulated by the city. Again, you just have to disclose that. And we've got all these forms and, and can help you with any of those um, questions if you have any. And if you or an immediate family member, and that's a spouse or a minor, minor child, uh, have more than 10% interest in a business doing business with the city, you also have to disclose that. So those are all the disclosures under the Ethics Act. Finally, we want to talk a little bit about sexual harassment. Um, the, 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 the position that you hold as the council is kind of weird when it comes to sexual harassment. Um, you, you probably can bring liability to the city, but there, it is sort of a gray area. And that is definitely not to encourage you to do any sexual harassment, um, but, but it's just 
just know that if you kind of look it up with the EEOC or the feds or something, uh, elected officials have a slightly different, um, have a slightly different standard. Uh, but the bottom line is if somebody's going to sue us, they're going to end up suing the entity of the city anyway. And, um, uh, it, we will end up having to deal with it. So uh, sexual harassment can be a hostile work environment or quid pro quo. And then there's this sort of subsection of both of those called retaliation. So we're going to start with hostile work environment. Hostile work environment is when you have a severe or pervasive behavior um, that is either sexual in nature or harassing in nature. And so we're talking about jokes, slurs, touching, uh, language, um, pictures, forwarded emails um, could, be a, could be a big thing. So all of those things, uh, again, uh, severe or pervasive. So what we're saying is if somebody slips up and tells a bad joke one time, it's probably not sexual harassment. It's not good. And we don't, again, encourage anyone to do this. but um, it's, it's probably not. If somebody tells a dumb, bad joke every day, that's pervasive. That means it's happening a lot. Or severe means something, some kind of sexual battery or something really bad one time. So severe or pervasive behavior uh, can create that hostile work environment. Uh, the next thing is a quid pro quo. And uh, this is an unwanted sexual advance uh, that makes a job benefit contingent on accepting that sexual advance. So, um, you know, we always say with, with the departments that work shifts, for example, you'll get a better shift if you go on a date with me or if you do this. Um, we, we don't want to, uh, we, we don't want to be doing any of that. And finally, uh, the thing that really gets you in all these sexual harassment cases is retaliation because it's, it's sometimes hard to prove these other things. But what's really easy to prove is when somebody reports sexual harassment, the supervisor then moves their shifts or gives them a bad assignment or disciplines them. That's all documentation. So, so retaliation is the one that is uh, the actual worse and gets us in the worst trouble. And I always want to add here that the city has a very robust uh, reporting and investigation procedure for sexual harassment. So if we, if we catch wind of it in any way, I mean, um, no, nobody gets to tell uh, legal or any supervisors, well, I'm just telling you this as a friend, but this thing happened. It's just, we, we don't do that here. If we catch wind of any kind of sexual harassment in any way, we immediately uh, begin an investigation through human resources, along with someone from my office, uh, we investigate it thoroughly, we write it up, and, and we uh, quickly come to a conclusion as to, as to whether it happened or not, and then take action depending on that. So uh, you, can, you can rest assured that we have a, a very good uh, program in place for the employees of the city. Was that five minutes, or was that a little longer? <laughs> Any questions? Anything for Mr. Bunderson? What about, uh, um, can a member of the council receive a campaign donation of more than $50 uh, from someone who does business with the city? Uh, yeah, that, that, uh, the, a campaign donation is one of the explicitly allowed things that, um, that council members can accept. It's carved out of the Ethics Act, campaign donations. Any other questions? And has to be reported on the campaign. Okay, so thank you. Yep. All right, we'll now turn the time over to Mr. Schertz for our legislative update, which I'm sure there's nothing going on there. Nothing going on. <laughs> uh, thanks for the opportunity, Mayor. I must say at the outset of this, I now am sufficiently ethics trained. This is my third time today. <laughs> Wayne Pyle, I did the city ethics review that is required annually. Then I got Eric's and then the legislature makes me do one as well. So triple checked on the ethics check today. Um, Maybe to sign off for you. Like it said completed in the uh, Paylocity. So I think we're good. Thanks, right. Wayne. <laughs> um, 
as far as the legislative update, first thing I wanted to just say is thanks for those who came and participated in local officials day last week. Hopefully you saw some value in that. It did look like we had a fairly good contingency from the UCD Council as well, so it was nice to see those folks up there. Um, for future local officials, Dave, if there's anything you want us to be doing more than what we did this time versus just kind of coordinating and getting you synced up with your legislators for the lunch, uh, we're happy to do that. Uh, that is something that the league does on an annual basis, so certainly happy to provide more robust services to the council and the mayor as it relates to locals officials day. Hopefully the meetings that the league put forward were uh, beneficial to you. I know, Mayor, you got a few extra assignments as the mayor of a large city here in, in the state of Utah as well. So thanks for your participation in that. Um, also this week, uh, for some of you who did participate, I know Nicole and I were there, and I think I saw a few of you on Zoom. Uh, the league did hold, host their first legislative policy committee. And I think for those who did participate in that, you heard most of what we're doing right now is a little bit of hurry up and wait. Uh, much of the legislation that we're anticipating is still just that, anticipating that legislation, which is still in the drafting queue. So right now, I believe the last time I looked, there are about 300 bill files that have currently been drafted and are out for consideration. In a typical legislative session, we'll see about 1,000 bill files in addition to the budget consideration that the legislature is doing. So still most of the work that we'll be working on as it relates to community development, land use, and some of the other major ticket items is still in the drafting phase. Uh, this week, we did as staff have an opportunity to meet with Senator, I call him Senator Niederhauser, Wayne Niederhauser, who's the Homeless Resource Coordinator for the state of Utah, to talk a little, about, a little bit about his agenda uh, for the siting of new homeless resource centers. The crux to that conversation uh, for this group was really on how we intend to pay for those services. Uh, there is a group of cities that are currently host to those homeless resource centers or uh, shelters that would like to see additional money going into the pool to pay for the kind of we'll call them the externalities or the external costs associated with being a host to one of those shelters. Mm -hmm. And there have been a couple of different ideas that have been floated, one of which includes removing the caps on those cities that pay into the fund. So if you're not familiar with that, what happens is statewide, anyone who's not host to a shelter pays into a fund to pay essentially a fee to those cities that can be used to pay for some of the external costs that they bear as, as a host city. West Valley City is currently covered by the cap. We're at the cap amount. Uh, we've conveyed to, uh, to Wayne Niederhauser as well as to the League of Cities and Towns our concerns with removal of that cap and have given some alternative both information and suggestions on how we can address putting more money into the pot. The idea is to raise an additional $4 million that would go to those host cities, 2 million of which would come from the state of Utah and 2 million of which would come from the remaining cities throughout the state uh, that would pay into that fund that I just described. Uh, part of the concept that we've been using is getting a little bit more nuanced in the, in the uh, funding formula that we use that would recognize that cities that are adjacent to communities that have a, a shelter, a homeless resource center, also bear significant costs such as West Valley City. And that should go into the equation when we're determining what each community should pay into that fund. That seems to be going over well. I will say the cities that are current um, shelter cities, if we can call them that, um, I think at the end of the day care that more money goes into the fund. I don't think they necessarily care how we get to that math as long as more money gets into the fund. So we've been working very closely with the league and with Wayne Niederhauser on that. And it does seem as though Wayne is very supportive mm -hmm of our strategy, which does include remaining, uh, having the caps uh, remain in place. So I'll conti continue to keep you updated on that. If you have any questions on how that process works or how the funding formula specifically works, I can certainly work with you individually and explain that process as well. Again, we do not have a bill file drafted on that. We anticipate Representative Elison, who represents the Midville area, will be carrying that legislation and the hope is working with the other stakeholders we can come to some consensus that will keep that cap in place, which I know is important to the council and you, Mayor, as well as the staff here at West Valley City. So uh, we'll continue to work on that issue. One of the other issues that was outlined by the council that you wanted to work up, oh, Wayne. Sorry, Lincoln, just a quick question. Do you have a general feel for, you said, which I already knew, that our city's capped on that contribution to that fund? What's the status of most of the cities in the state? Are they also capped or do you have a feel I would, for I would it? I have to look and see which cities are capped and are not capped. It's a dollar amount cap. So generally speaking, it's going to be our large city or large population centers that are capped. Um, but let me get you the full list and I can tell you which other cities do have the cap in place. I know there are a few. Any other questions on that? Uh, one of the other items that you asked us uh, to cover and work on this year during the 
uh, legislative session was the utilization of photo enforcement for traffic violations on some of our major corridors. Uh, we do finally have our bill file out, Senator Jerry Stevenson from Layton. Uh, and this is all in the tracking sheet that's on that Google Drive that you can access as well. But he does have a bill file out. It would expand the ability for Photocop to be used. As the bill was drafted, it's very broad. It essentially uses allows every agency on every corridor in the state to utilize Photocop as an enforcement mechanism. Uh, recognizing some of the pushback that we're getting in the legislature, he is looking to tailor that down to be major corridors. So what we define as major arterials within our communities would have the ability to have that enforcement mechanism with additional signage and the requirement that if someone does receive a ticket through Photocop, they first get a warning, letting them know that there is Photocop enforcement before they actually get a, a ticket with a monetary violation associated with it. Um, he is drafting that amendment. It's likely that that bill will be going to the transportation committee within the next couple of days. So we're actively working with him as well as the chief of police uh, on that legislation. We'll be providing talking points, uh, both to you as the council and you mayor, as well as to the police department as we uh, prepare for that discussion that's coming before the Senate. Um, with that, we're, we're pretty much focused on the budget at this point. As I've mentioned in previous updates, the legislature is busy balancing a $24.5 billion checkbook. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion taking place on just kind of building the basic building blocks of that budget. And then most of the discretionary spending discussions start taking place within the, about the next week, week and a half. And that's where we'll have a few items as well that you've kind of highlighted for us to work on this year as well. Um, Mayor, that's the update I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And certainly if, it, if anyone has questions about bills that are on the updated sheet um, on the Google Drive, I'm happy to answer those as well this time. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Appreciate all your work up there. All right, we'll now go to our council calendar. Anybody have any concerns on the calendar? Okay. Potential future agenda items. Anybody? Not a, maybe not a future agenda item, but communication. We've had a lot of discussion over the last few months about our form of government. And I have to be honest, I didn't have a clue of what that really meant a year ago and still am learning. And so um, I'd like an outline of our form of government and then all the others that are approved and any process requirement for making a change. So, is that something okay. we can get? <laughs> Okay. Pros and cons of, of each. Okay. Anybody else? It's fine. I had something and I can't find it. When you want to oh, do sorry. it. You might be on for next week. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I mean, my. My thing I had, it's on here somewhere. Okay, so that one. Any others? Okay, so council reports. Okay, I had the privilege of going to a luncheon today. I would tell you who it is, but I don't know. They use acronyms and I have no idea, except that they deal with trees. They're arborists. And... <laughs> Our parks department had probably 15 or more of our employees there. They got the community award. We're awarded that today. And it was a pretty big deal. And it was quite a nice little luncheon. I mean, there was other awards, not just them, but for them to get that was pretty amazing. Darren over in that department does a great job and featuring mm -hmm. others, what he's doing and to follow on. So that was a great opportunity. And um, Darren approached me with a uh, possibility of maybe doing a tree planting in Karen Main's name. So if the council's good with that, we can maybe tell Nancy's not here, but we can let her know that that might be a great thing. And he was thinking, I don't know, there's this park near her house. I can't now, and right now I can't tell you which one it was, but he had a park in mind that he could plant that in her memory. She hasn't passed, but just for her service okay. to the city. So since she's had to retire. 
So sounds good. Sound good with everybody? Yes. yes. Okay. I should have said, is anybody opposed to it? I figured everybody was for it. Okay. Um, strategic plan list. Is there anything ready for tonight? Okay. You had the, no, you put out a schedule. We, right. We're going to yeah. attach it to the agenda every week, I guess. So that's why. Okay. We're still on the scene in case we had anything ahead of it. <laughs> oh, no, I did not understand. I just got it. <laughs> well, do you think it'll be C every time? We'll have to see. Might be B next time. All right. Um, was there a need for a closed session? Yes, ma'am. Just for continuing discussion on last week's uh, discussion, as I understand it, for professional competency. Okay. Anybody want to make that motion? So moved. Okay. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Nicole. Councilman uh, Nordbelt? Yes. Councilman Christensen? Yes. Councilman Hewn? <laughs> yes. Councilman Harmon? Yes. Councilman Whetstone? Yes. Councilman Fittisamanu? Aye. And Mayor Link? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Yes. Well, move into a closed session. We won't discuss anything else. And then we will adjourn our study session at the end of that closed mm -hmm. session.